Hi, good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm Jennifer Cruz, a psychiatrist here, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Cho. Um, Dr. Cho and I actually did residency here at the Simmel Institute together uh, from 2009 to 2013. But before that, Dr. Cho was already an accomplished psychiatrist and researcher, having completed his medical school training and his uh, residency at the University of Sao Paulo, followed by epidemiology training at uh, 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 the London School of, excuse me, it's a nice one, <laughs> of hygiene and tropical medicine and a PhD in epidemiological and psychosomatic medicine at uh, King's College in London. Um, subsequent to that, Dr. Cho completed postdoctoral training under the mentorship of Michael Irwin here at UCLA in the Cousins Center of Psychoneuroimmunology. And um, uh, after residency, uh, continued his ongoing trajectory of greatness. Um, it's uh, kind of notorious that uh, Dr. Cho submitted his K-23 and got a perfect score on his first submission of that. Uh, he's gone on to have many, many publications and be either PI or co-PI on uh, many different studies. And um, his, his primary focus has involved uh, looking at and investigating the biobehavioral mechanisms linking physical and mental health, and especially um, targetable mechanisms li linking sleep and both physical and mental health. Um, along these lines, clinically, he went on to um, begin the UCLA Insomnia Clinic and directs that here. Um, we're very grateful for that clinical resource in addition to all of his uh, wonderful uh, research accomplishments. So very much looking forward to Dr. Cho's talk today. Um, welcome, Dr. Cho. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. And Dr. Cruz, thank you for your kind words. Uh, today, I'll talk about insomnia treatment, focusing on CBTI. And let me share my screen now. Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia. Uh, we started UCLA Insomnia Clinic in 2019, so three years ago. It was hard work, but rewarding work to start and run this clinic. Likewise, CBTI is actually hard work, intense work, but very rewarding. Uh, I remember on a Saturday morning, waking up much earlier than I wanted. And first thing I was thinking in my mind was the burden of having to treat all those insomnia patients coming to our clinic. So it is sometimes a burden, but the reward is much larger than the burden. So patients who were suffering from insomnia for years or even decades after failing multiple treatments come to our clinic and get this treatment and have full remission in within two months. And then they send me wonderful thank you notes. That's great reward. Uh, indeed, CBTI works in great treatment. However, it's not for everyone. Some people drop out in the middle of the treatment and some people do not respond to treatment. So we also offer an alternative non-medication treatment to CBTI, which is mindfulness. So today's talk will be first a rational and content of CBTI, and then talk about who would be good responder to CBTI. And lastly, talk about something beyond CBTI, meaning what we can do further as an add-on treatment to CBTI to improve the benefit of CBTI. Uh, obviously, insomnia disorder is very highly prevalent uh, condition. It is 10 to 15% in the general population. And when I say insomnia disorder, it is clinical insomnia according to official definitions, which include three months of duration or longer and exclude sleep deprivation, meaning that patients are having sleep problems despite adequate opportunity for sleep. These two uh, aspects are important for my talk today. And CBTI is the first line treatment of insomnia, more exactly speaking, chronic insomnia. 
as recommended by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and American College of Physicians. And it consists in eight to uh, six to eight weeks treatment with lasting benefit for years, even after the treatment is concluded. However, it has also some downside limitations. First, attrition. Uh, it's about 8% in RCTs and higher in clinical practice. Report research shows that 10 to 40% in general sleep clinic population drop out before completing CBTR. So that's a serious problem. And uh, non-remission is another problem. So 40 to 60% do not achieve full remission and about 20% do not respond. Response meaning certain level of improvement after starting the treatment. Now, frankly, I would say uh, this non-remission rate. So in other words, actually, it means that 40 to 60 percent who get CBTI have full remission. I think this is a very good success rate in our field of psychiatry. However, anyway, this is a challenge we face everyday practice. Uh, so now let me talk about the content of uh, rational and content of CBTI. I want to do first a quiz uh, with you. So who would live longest. So I want you to answer this poll uh, that I will want, launch now. So one who sleeps four hours a night, five hours a night on average, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. You can answer now. Uh, who would live longest? Uh, okay. So single choice, do you see the poll? I'm not seeing the answer, but you might be answering right now. Okay, let me try again. Uh, okay, here. So who to live longest? Okay, I see, yes. Thank you for answering. Um, okay. As we don't have like endless time for this presentation, I uh, will uh, end the poll now, by the way, and share the results. Okay. I guess you're seeing the results. Okay. So great, great. Seven hours as the best sleep duration for longevity and eight hours, and then six, then nine, good. Now let me show you the actual results uh, ranking based on extensive research data. Uh, you guys actually you know, are really uh, knowledgeable and you know that eight hours is not the best sleep duration, great. And actually the study shows that six to seven hours are the best sleep duration. They are tied at the top. And then five and eight hours of sleep duration on average are the next best tied as well. This is, for, is based on, for example, uh, this meta-analysis of 57 prospect cohort studies. As you can see, there is this mirror image of this curve, six, to, six and seven being the best sleep duration for longevity and five and eight being the next best. And, a couple of individual studies that are important in this field also show similar results, some variation. Here, five is actually better than eight. And we conducted a meta-analysis just now of prospect cohort studies involving older adults. The idea was that because older adults tend to sleep less than younger adults, so this best sleep duration for longevity could be a little different. So we ran this meta-analysis of uh, about 20 st studies, 23 studies. Uh, then we looked at uh, average sleep amount each night and their longevity. It shows again, six and seven hours as the best. They are not statistically different. And then uh, five hours is better than eight. 
and then four and eight seems to be roughly same. So again, what I can say for sure is like six to seven hours is again the best sleep duration in for longevity. Of course, these data are not from RCTs, not causation, but this is prediction. So what I can say for sure is that if you or your patient are sleeping now six or seven hours, that's really good. So you don't have to worry about uh, if you're sleeping six or seven hours. But what happens is that everyone thinks, not maybe you are more knowledgeable of this field, but most patients and most of the population believe that we should sleep eight hours a night. Actually, some very famous book about sleep written by serious researcher actually keeps saying, you should sleep eight hours. I read that book. And you know, in many websites of even some sleep experts say eight hours as the best sleep duration, but that's not really true. Six and seven appears the best for longevity in different age groups from 18 and up, including all the adults. And also because it is, it is not true. And I would say eight hours of sleep as the must sleep duration for health and longevity is not true. Also because sleep needs vary a lot across people and even the same person's sleep needs vary over time and circumstances. So there is no fixed amount of sleep, but if you function well after six hours of sleep, that's what you need. But because we are bombarded with this message of eight hours of sleep as the must sleep duration, we get anxious when we cannot get eight hours of sleep. Now, how many of you in the audience can have eight hours of sleep consistently? I cannot. <laughs> At my age, I cannot sleep eight hours a night anymore. And most of insomnia patients cannot generate eight hours of sleep. And they don't have to, according to the data we have. But because they are not having eight hours of sleep, they get very anxious, fearful, and stressed about it. One of my patients just a few weeks ago, 54-year-old lady, said to me, exactly, I get stressed to sleep eight hours a night. That was her words. So that happens a lot in our patients. And that anxiety and fear about sleep make them suffer much more. Not only subjective suffering because of anxiety, but because anxiety and fear, stress actually arouse them. And hyper arousal is one of the main mechanisms of insomnia. They will actually sleep worse objectively as well. So first thing we do in our CBTI program is to provide these normalizing facts about sleep so that they can have a little more flexible and relaxed view on their sleep. Actually, insomnia patients, because they think about sleep a lot, which is natural, they become a perfectionist about sleep. Not Maybe not about other issues, but about perfect, uh, sleep, uh, people become perfectionists when they have insomnia. And this perfectionism actually is not helpful. And this approach can lessen the perfectionism of our sleep. And another purpose of this quiz, the idea of best sleep duration for longevity is a preparation for sleep restriction, which is a, one of the major interventions we do in CBTI, and we will talk about it. Uh, even this word itself, sleep restriction, will stress out our patients. They get up, uh, stressed about the idea of restricting their sleep, although it's not exactly that is the case. But so if they know that sleeping six or seven hours is good enough, even five hours is actually as good as eight hours, they actually feel much less stressed about doing this intervention called sleep restriction. So you will see what I mean in the next slides. Okay. Of course, this is not only the cognitive component of CBTI we offer to our patient, there are many more components, but I think this would be quiz and sleep duration idea would be simple and easy piece of information you, the audience can use in your practice if you have any patient who have insomnia together with other conditions. Now, let me talk about behavior components of CBTI which are actually the most powerful components of CBTI. To understand uh, these behavior components, we need to understand how we develop insomnia. 
So we use this 3P model. First P is predisposing factors of insomnia. Something that predisposes us to develop insomnia, for example, family history of insomnia, uh, that obviously can be a genetic component. And something that maybe is there in our patient even before they were born or some mental illness like depression, anxiety, they had well before the onset of insomnia. Those factors can make our patient more vulnerable to develop insomnia. And then they experience some stress, different kinds of stress, and that may trigger precipitate insomnia. You may have experience of having stress and then have some sleepless nights, lose sleep at night, and they have insomnia for a few nights. Uh, so that's very common uh, happening. And then the most important piece, a third one, perpetuating factors of insomnia. So let me talk about that. So uh, as I said, 10 to 15% of the population have insomnia disorder, which basically means chronic insomnia, three months or longer. However, more than half the population have insomnia complaints so or acute insomnia. So some of them develop clinical insomnia, insomnia disorder, which actually burdensome and suffering, and they come to our clinic. Uh, so why some people come to have chronic insomnia, perpetuated insomnia is very important question. Let me explain what perpetuate insomnia and make our patient to suffer from insomnia for years and decades. For example, when uh, a patient has poor sleep night and their natural tendency is to compensate for that. So after poor night of sleep and the next morning they may sleep in for a few hours. They may feel better after sleeping for a few hours and do better during the day. However, later at night, they will not be able to sleep well because they slept too much in the morning. In the same way, they may want to take a nap because they are tired after poor sleep and they take a nap for a few hours in the afternoon, although they may feel better, then they have trouble sleeping later at night. So these attempts to compensate for sleep end up creating a vicious cycle because they don't sleep well after sleeping in or taking a nap, then next day they will do it again, sleeping in or taking a nap, then it becomes a vicious cycle. And some people, for example, especially when they can not sleep in or take a nap because they are working all day long, they come home, they may try to go to bed earlier than usual. Then that is also a problem because they will not feel sleepy and toss and turn a lot. And even they fall asleep by going to bed earlier, they may wake up earlier in, uh, in the middle of night and suffer. Even when they sleep throughout the night, luckily, they may have trouble sleeping the next night. So these attempts to compensate for poor sleep ends up backfiring and prolonging insomnia. Trying harder to sleep. This is a universal perpetuating factor in any insomnia patients. As they are not sleeping well, they will try harder to sleep. But making effort to sleep will even uh, make, make them more awake, frustrated, and upset, but will not help them sleep better. For example, trying harder to sleep by counting sheep or repeatedly saying that I need to sleep, I need to sleep, will arouse them more and make them more awake. Um, also, because insomnia patients are tired after poor sleep, they may cancel daytime activities and try to rest more. Uh, and then, because they are not exerting themselves enough during the day, they may not build up sleepiness enough and then have trouble sleeping. So, obviously, you all know that exercise is a good medicine for uh, insomnia. So, that is another perpetuating factor of insomnia. Now, non-sleep activities in bed. As we don't sleep well in bed, we do other things than sleep in bed. Watch TV in bed, use cell phone. By the way, everyone uses cell phone nowadays. And uh, read in bed, work in bed with a laptop, eat in bed, fight in bed, 
do everything in bed and also rest or wake in bed a lot. So all these non-sleep activities in bed will end up prolonging insomnia because the more non-sleep activity in bed we do, the more likely we get conditioned to bed as a wakefulness place. So this is actually famous Pavlovian classical conditioning happening in bed. We will talk more about it. Uh, so uh, by the way, let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer. Just uh, think about that yourself. What would be the most common non-sleep activity in bed insomnia patients do? The most common non-sleep activity insomnia patients do in bed. So people may say, use cell phone, watch TV, read, and so on. And actual, this is an actual trick question. Then actual response is not sleeping, obviously, or in other words, staying awake. That is most common non-sleep activity insomnia patients do in bed. And that has important implication. The more time awake they spend, the more likely that they get conditioned to bed as a wakefulness place. Uh, next, self-medicating strategies, drinking to sleep. Yeah, indeed, it will uh, mess up with sleep even more. Now, even prescribed sleep medication in long term will not help, uh, at least in psychological sense, because if the patients have a sleep medication uh, available, then they will rely on them. And when they stop taking it, they experience rebound insomnia and confirm that they cannot sleep without sleep medications. So they don't have the opportunity of exerting their own strategies, their own ability resources to overcome insomnia, but rely on medications. Uh, some people may need sleep medication for long term, but usually we don't recommend that. And worry and anxiety in general, of course, and also insomnia patients obviously worry about sleeping a lot. That will keep them up more aroused and more awake. Yeah, and lack of sleep confidence. So graphically showing, for example, as I said, this lady, uh, 40, 54 year old lady I saw recently, she had family history of insomnia. So that is a predisposing factor. And then, during the pandemic two years ago, because of the stress of pandemic, she started having insomnia nights. So onset. And then in acute phase of her insomnia, she was obviously spending more time in bed to make up for poor sleep nights by sleeping in mostly on weekends. And also she was doing many non-sleep activities in bed, using cell phone in bed, watching YouTube and reading in bed, and so on, and spending a long time awake in bed. So these perpetuating factors in red color actually contribute to the insomnia more and more. Now, two years after the stress of the pandemic and pandemic lockdown, she's not having that stress anymore, but she's having even more serious insomnia because of these perpetuating factors. So CBTI is essentially uh, attempts to reduce and remove these perpetuating factors. So this red rectangle, you know, getting reduced after CBTI. So let's talk a little more about these two major perpetuating factors of insomnia uh, and talk about major interventions we do. So spending more time in bed is classically uh, important perpetuating factor of insomnia and non-sleep activities in bed, including time long time awake in bed. So to address spending more time in bed issue, we do sleep restriction, correctly speaking, time in bed restriction. And then for non-sleep activities in bed, we do stimulus control. Let's talk about them now. Uh, first, we want to understand how our sleep-wake cycle is regulated. So it is regulated by two separate biological mechanisms, sleep pressure and circadian rhythm. Sleep pressure is simply sleepiness, and uh, it is also called sleep drive. So as we stay awake for a long time, then we feel more sleepy. 
And that means that we are building up sleepiness or in other words, sleep pressure. And circadian rhythm, as you all know, the rhythm, the biological rhythm of our body and controlled by melatonin, uh, other mechanisms, usually around 24 hour cycle with a lot of uh, influence by the light exposure and regular sleep schedule. These two issues are important for good sleep. And the first purpose of CBTI is to strengthen sleep pressure and regulate circadian rhythm. And this first purpose of CBTI, we usually ach mostly achieve by doing sleep restriction. And the second purpose of CBTI is to break disruptive association between bed and not sleeping, uh, especially talking about non-sleep activities. And this we achieve mostly by doing stimulus control. Now, let me talk about them a little more. First, sleep restriction. So sleep restriction actually is a misnomer. Uh, it's not a correct name because we don't restrict sleep itself, but we restrict time in bed so that our patient can increase amount of restorative sleep, refreshing sleep. So it should call, uh, it is sometimes called time in bed restriction or sometimes uh, sleep efficiency training. For example, that lady, uh, 54 year old lady, she was going to bed at 10 p.m. every night, most nights, and then having trouble falling asleep and staying asleep with wakefulness here, and then getting up at every morning around 8 a.m. So as you can see, she's sleeping maybe one, two, three, four, five, six hours out of 10 hours. So very low sleep efficiency, 60%. So we want her to improve her sleep efficiency, sleep quality. So I would tell, ask her to go to bed uh, 2 a.m., for example four hours later so that she can stay in bed for six hours only and then get up at six, uh, eight o'clock in the morning as before. So she would do it for one week, for example. And then what would happen is that she will feel very sleepy by 2 a.m. by staying up until 2 a.m. And then she goes to bed, falls asleep easily and stay asleep longer and better. We are squeezing out this wakefulness by restricting time in bed. She will sleep a little less than six hours, but close to six hours, which will be much better quality sleep. So as I said, she first should set up get up time, which should be same for every day, ideally for months and even years, 8 a.m. for example. And then we would restrict her time in bed to average total sleep time, which was six hours. Therefore, she would spend only six hours in bed and go to bed 2 a.m. and get up at 8 a.m. She would do it for eight weeks, uh, no, one week. Will be a little bit of suffering at the beginning. So we say that it is short-term pain for long-term gain. But as we, sh as we she will sleep more efficiently, we may increase her time in bed 15 minutes or 30 minutes next week and so on. Yeah, this is time in bed restriction. It is a powerful treatment with Quick fix. However, this is uh, not all. We will not do sleep restriction forever, but it's more of at the start and very efficient way of starting CBTI. And it will also help stimulus control. So second uh, major component of CBTI is stimulus control. And as this is second purpose of CBTI I just explained, if you rem remember, so that is break the disruptive association between bed and not sleeping. Many insomnia patients have this particular problem called conditioned arousal because they spend time awake in bed repeatedly, night and night, tossing and turning and suffering. Then they get conditioned to bed as a wakefulness place. And as I said, this is famous Pavlovian classical conditioning, and indeed it happens. So when they are sleepy out of their bed, they think, oh, it's time to go to bed. I'm going to fall asleep quickly. But once they are in bed, strangely, they become wide awake and cannot fall asleep. 
this is very frequent problem. And then we want to undo this. We need to undo this problem. Otherwise we have actual trouble in long run. So sleep restriction, for example, will make our patient very sleepy at the beginning of the night. And then they will go to bed feeling very sleepy, much more sleepy than usual. So no matter what conditional arousal or anxiety they have, they will end up falling asleep fairly easily. And then in a while we will increase time in bed and they may feel just slightly sleepy and they are able to go to bed and fall asleep without problem. And as they repeat this process of going to bed only sleeping, only when they are sleepy or and using bed only for sleep, they will end up even developing this opposite thing to conditioned arousal, conditioned sleepiness, meaning that even when they are not sleepy, they go to bed, lie down, they feel sleepy and fall asleep quickly. So the goal would be like this, the baby hitting the pillow and falling asleep right away, happy and easy as you can see in her mouth. Yeah. So ideally this is a goal of course. Uh, oh, by the way, this, she's not my daughter, uh, although she's very cute. So stimulus control is, in a way, making bed great for sleep again, or making our patients get used to bed as a great place for sleep again. And that's the stimulus control. Now, some patients, actually many patients, including myself at one time in my life, thought, well, we are gonna control stimulus, stimuli like light and noise, but that's not the stimulus control. Actually, stimulus means the bed the bed being a stimulus check, either for wakefulness or sleepiness. So we want to change the bed from the cue for wakefulness to cue for sleepiness. That is the stimulus control. And this is actually a little more important than sleep restriction in long-term. Although we will not do sleep restriction forever, actually we will do, patients will do stimulus control forever in a way. So, Actual techniques of stimulus control, as you now may realize, is to lie down only when sleepy and using bed only for sleep, exceptionally sex. Now, because, so we need to avoid any non-sleep activities in bed. And because the most common non-sleep activity in bed is staying awake, so patients should avoid staying awake in bed. These are techniques of stimulus control. And, in uh, practice for logistic issues, we want to set up a buffer zone. We call it buffer zone, usually living room where patients wind down and relax before they go to bed. We call it buffer because it's a buffer between bedroom, which is a sanctuary for sleep and busy life area like study, garage, uh, and so on. So <clears throat> this, a one hour of winding down is also very important because many patients with insomnia have hyperarousal, so they need to wind down before they go to bed. If you work until your bedtime, maybe writing a paper or preparing a lecture, you're not going to be able to fall asleep. You're not going to be able to switch off your mind. Same thing for insomnia patients. So they spend about one hour before their be assigned bedtime winding down in this buffer zone doing something pleasant, relaxing, sedentary, in dim light without using screens. And then they would go to bed at their assigned bedtime. If they cannot fall asleep within 20 minutes, which is sometimes happen because of conditioned arousal, they may get out of bed and go to their buffer zone. And for example, read, which will make them feel sleepy faster than staying in bed, insisting to stay in bed. So. When I first heard about this idea, I thought, absurd. How do you want me to <laughs> get out of bed in the middle of night and I will be more awake? Um, but the idea is that patients are already suffering and tossing and turning awake in bed. So why to suffer in bed? Rather, they would enjoy their time relaxing in buffer zone by not focusing on trying harder to sleep. And they may have less performance anxiety about sleep. and by reading, they will also distract their mind from million worries and they tend to feel sleepy faster. And when they feel sleepy, they go back to bed. And this 
They practice even in the middle of night when they awake and cannot get back to sleep in about 20 minutes. Yeah. In the morning, they get up at the same time, no matter what, no matter how many hours they slept, no matter what day of the week. So this is also very important. Uh, summarizing, uh, this is in patient-friendly summary and what uh, we would do in CBTI, especially focusing on sleep restriction and uh, stimulus control. So we want them to spend less time in bed because they should sleep short and deep rather than long and shallow and other items I already explained. So now uh, I want to talk about uh, who would most likely benefit from CBTI. So as I said, uh, CBTI has limitations, attrition problem, and non-response and non-remission problem. So we wrote this uh, review paper uh, based on the conceptual model of CBTI, rational of CBTI and then predictors of adherence and predictors of treatment response. And this was our the first paper of, from our insomnia clinic with the contribution of our uh, clinic attendings, Dr. Stephanie Kramer and Dr. Jeffrey Young. By the way, I'm excited because more papers are coming out with participation of our, of our clinic attendings. So first, favorable characteristic or CBTI response is the presence of maladaptive behaviors that serve as perpetuating factors. For example, as I said, spending long time in bed, sleeping in, napping, going to bed early, and doing non-sleep activities in bed, especially staying awake for long time. Now, uh, if they don't have any of these perpetuating factor behaviors, then uh, we may consider some other treatments. So it means that some patients don't sleep well, have chronic insomnia, although they have healthy sleep habits, sleep behavior. They don't spend long time in bed. They don't nap. They use bed only for sleep. Still, they have insomnia, maybe because of hyperarousal. In those cases, we may consider treatment like mindfulness instead, for example. Second, Favorable characteristic is longer sleep duration. It may sound obvious, but for several reasons, this is actually a good predictor of response to CBTI. I, I don't mean long sleep duration, but longer. So uh, one of the reasons is because patients having a little longer sleep duration at baseline of CBTI may do time in bed restriction uh, better and a little more easily with less anxiety about it. So in case our patients are sleeping too short at baseline, we may consider some alternative treatments like mindfulness, or we may consider time-limited treatment with sleep medication in the first weeks of CBTI with discontinuation before the CBTI completion. So this may improve uh, the adherence and some early onset of improvement uh, helping our patient to conclude CBTI. I will talk about it a little long more in the last session of uh, this talk. Third favorable characteristic, reduced use of hypnotics or not using at all. If they are using hypnotic medications, we may taper off during the CBTI course. It is really satisfying for our patient, but in practice, it is good because tapering of sleep medication helps the outcome of CBTI. Uh, fourth favorable characteristic is properly treated psychiatric comorbidities. So many patients have depression and anxiety and other psychiatric issues as underlying conditions of chronic insomnia. Now, treating depression and anxiety usually does not lead to a resolution of chronic insomnia. Actually, they remain with almost same uh, case of insomnia, even after treating depression and anxiety properly. But if we don't treat psychiatric comorbidities well, 
then they don't get as much benefit they could from CBTI. So it is important to treat depression anxiety, ideally before starting CBTI. Uh, we also conducted a research study to confirm these uh, findings of our review paper. So we contacted three authors of uh, three RCTs and requested their raw data. And so we are analyzing this data at individual level data, uh, conducting pooled analysis, kind of meta-analysis. Uh, so this study uh, was done with the contribution of my medical student, Brianna Hines. And the results show that uh, short sleep duration, less than six hours, is a predictor of poor response to CBTI. And depression symptom at baseline was also a predictor of poor response to CBTI. I know there are some questions and raising hands, but let me handle them at the end of presentation. Uh, given the time uh, limitation. Now, lastly, uh, let me talk about what we can do beyond CBTI. So I am writing now, uh, editing, guest editing an issue of journal Slim Medicine Clinics with the title, Adjunct Interventions to CBTI. This is an issue addressing alternative and adjunctive treatment to CBTI to improve uh, CBTI and to complement limitations of CBTI. So we, I initially planned 13 chapters, but one author had to withdraw in the middle. So it has 12 chapters. I will mention some of them today, briefly. Partner Alliance. This is a very simple but important strategy to enhance the effect of CBTI. Bad partners should be on the same page with our patients to enhance, actually to enable implementation and adherence to CBTI. Bad partner may help our patient to stay awake until they're assigned bedtime, time in bed restriction, and may help by not getting upset when they need to get out of bed in the middle of night. So helping with stimulus control. Paradoxical intention. This is old evidence-based treatment for insomnia. So patients try to stay awake in bed for as long as possible with the intention of staying awake rather than trying harder to sleep. So they stay in bed with eyes open comfortably and try to stay awake. What happens is uh, they have less sleep-related performance on the anxiety by doing uh, something opposite and with paradoxical intention, and they tend to sleep better. As I said, trying harder to sleep is a perpe uh, universal perpetuating factor of insomnia. Circadian rhythm regulation. So advancing circadian rhythm or delaying circadian rhythm depending on the type of insomnia can be helpful. It's not only for those with advanced sleep phase or delayed sleep phase disorders, but sleep onset insomnia and early morning awakening. Behavioral activation. So you may know this as a treatment for depression, but it also can be used for insomnia treatment and it promotes more active, pleasant, fulfilling, valuable well-being behaviors during the day. And then they may have better mood and also may have more activities and even stronger sleep pressure to sleep better at night. Intensive sleep retraining. This is very interesting uh, treatment. So patients come to a sleep lab and then they may fall asleep, but then they are awakened shortly afterwards, repeatedly throughout a session of tw about 24 hours. So patients will be awakened about 50 times. They fall asleep 50 times and wake up, are awakened 50 times. As they do this, they have increasing sleep pressure over time and then increasingly quit sleep onset then it actually get rid of this conditioned arousal. Yeah, it's very interesting treatment. We haven't done it in our clinic, but it's available. And mindfulness, as I mentioned a few times, this is evidence-based intervention for insomnia with several RCTs and meta-analysis as well. And this mindfulness 
through the guided meditation is uh, thought to reduce nighttime hyperarousal, which is the main mechanism of insomnia. Biofeedback, training self-regulation using biofeedback, feedback from biological measures, heart rate, for example, are uh, attending. Dr. Primer wrote this chapter. Lastly, hypnotic medications. As I said, hypnotic actually can be added in the first week of CBTI to improve the outcome, short outcome, certainly, and we'll be discontinuing this medication before the completion of CBTI. And we know from RCT data that it promotes faster onset of sleep improvement without reducing long-term benefits of CBTI. So this is another important uh, chapter we wrote. Dr. Marco Polos, our attending, wrote this with me. So a little bit uh, rushed at the end, but thank you for your attention. And I also want to say thank you to my colleagues here. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cho. That was a really wonderful presentation. Uh, learned a lot. and. We have several questions from the audience, so let's uh, get to it. So, a um, uh, couple that came up. One, one just to start with, somebody wanted to clarify, ask if you could clarify the definition of insomnia, since there's a lot of different types of sleep complaints that people may have. Oh uh, yeah, so we talk about trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, and early morning awakening initial, middle, and um, terminal insomnia, and any of these sleep difficulties happening at least three nights a week for three months or longer, despite proper opportunity to sleep. Okay. Thank you. And from my clinical practice, I have, have patients with sleep complaints, and, and sometimes I'm not sure if their sleep expectations are, are realistic. If somebody, for example, um, you know, wakes up several times in the night, but goes back to sleep without any difficulty, you know, awake maybe five minutes or less. Yeah. How, how do you kind of think about that type of a, a sleep problem? So another piece of normalizing fact we provide to our patient at the beginning of the CBTI is that our sleep is very imperfect, even in normal good sleep. Actually, because we have sleep cycles every 90 minutes, Whenever we finish one cycle, we have almost awake moments. So normally we get almost awake, but what happens to insomnia patients because of their perfectionism, because their hyper attention to their sleep, they remember all these imperfections. Of course, not only normal imperfection, but real imperfection as well. And they have this uh, disparate subjective sensation, perception, which is much worse than their sleep. So this is real thing. So we explain this. And in some patients with clear mismatch between their perception of sleep and objective sleep, we recommend wearable devices like uh, ActiGraph, Fitbit, so that we can show the mismatch. Yeah. Okay. Important cool. issue, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Very important issue. We've had a few questions come in about melatonin and sort of the role of melatonin. Does it help? Does it harm? Is it good long-term, um, uh, and there is also a question kind of related to that about circadian rhythm disorders and whether CBTI would be appropriate for circadian rhythm disorders. So first, melatonin uh, meta-analysis, a few meta-analysis uh, show, um, if I did like a review of all meta-analysis of melatonin, I would say melatonin has tiny benefit for sleep. Not only because of circadian rhythm regulation, but there is a tiny effect overall. But still, it's not a great help, by the way. And But at least it doesn't create that addictive pattern as other sleep medications. So uh, I usually say it is okay to take, but in practice, they don't get much benefit, <laughs> especially in our clinic. Uh, patient with severe insomnia. Now, there is another benefit of melatonin, which if not many people know. I wrote a meta-analysis on that effect, which is anti-inflammatory effect. There is clear anti-inflammatory effect of melatonin. So there may be some other benefits than sleep benefit. Now, uh, 
it is not devoid of any downside, by the way. The more and more you know, uh, opinions and reports are coming out with about some detrimental effects. So, but although very benign, usually, is a hormone that we have. Uh, so at the end, it may have tiny benefit, but usually not very helpful. But that, that's why I, I don't prohibit because it doesn't help much. So it doesn't, people don't get rely to rely on it that much. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. complex. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Related to that, um, there are questions about like, what medications would be appropriate. Somebody asked about diazepam. Um, when you're talking about hypnotics that you use during, you know, initial part of CBTI, like what, what would you recommend as a hypnotic for sleep, even if short term? First, first, I don't recommend any sleep medications. We rarely prescribe sleep medications in our uh, insomnia treatment, but based on research RCT data uh, that try to uh, combination of sleep medication for short term and CBTI, we know that. Uh, I was not planning to say any name of specific medication, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Zopidem, half-life, um, intermediate half-life um, Z drugs uh, has been tested in that purpose of adding on to CBTI and Trazone was tested. Those two medications were tested in larger clinical trials. Not that I'd recommend them, but they are uh, used as an add-on to CBTI, that specific purpose, by the way. Yeah. Okay. There's um, a number of questions around sort of the um, evening activities, relaxation training, prayer, um, when you should cut off vigorous exercise, kind of the um, yeah. those types of, of questions. Yeah. Any so we recommend our patient to have at least three hours uh, of gap between last exercise and bedtime. Because if they do exercise too late, they will be too stimulated. Same with work, by the way. And uh, so, as I said, the buffer zone is a idea of winding down well. So at least one hour, they should wind down doing relaxation, you know. Reading book is best because it's boring. Not because reading is intellectually, you know, noble, but because reading is boring. So I think it's the best way to wind down. Yeah. Um, now, I think there was one question about circadian rhythm. Uh, circadian rhythm is not exactly the target of CBTI, but by having regular sleep schedule as part of CBTI, circadian rhythm uh, dis disorder patient improve. By the way, circadian rhythm regulation is a part of CBTI, through the sleep restriction, but circadian rhythm disorder are not actually uh, exactly the treatment uh, target for CBTI, but we do it often. For example, using light therapy for uh, patients who have trouble, uh, they are sleeping too early and then waking up too early. This is advanced sleep phase. Then we use light therapy in the evening so that we can delay their sleep phase. And the other way around for um, delayed sleep phase syndrome and melatonin also in those cases, in low dose, by the way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I understand that you do not recommend medication generally. Um, however, there's some questions about other supplements like magnesium or lavender and some specific questions about trazodone, including what the pros and cons are for long-term use. Someone knows that it's not recommended by ASM and, and asks you to discuss that a little bit. Yeah, so um, magnesium appears to help. Uh, so we discussed that in our clinic, but I haven't seen like extensive research data to back it up, but it doesn't seem to be sedating, sedating by itself. So in that sense, in like similar to melatonin, it may not be so detrimental. As you can see, my skepticism of medications. And trazodone is a very interesting medication. Actually, there was a meta-analysis of combination treatment for depression recently. And that meta-analysis showed that treating patient 
depression with an SSRI and the sedating dose of trazone, not antidepressant dose of trazone, was helpful for depression. In that sense, I would be a little more positive about trazone, but and trazone is not as addictive as benzodiazepine and Z drugs, but still it has issues, problem. So I, again, I, I don't recommend any of those medications. Unless for short term, yeah. Okay. Um, there was were a couple of questions about um, that I, I think may be somewhat related. Somebody asked about if there is a set, set of people that you know of that when they wait, stay up longer, become increasingly aroused. And if so, what do we know about them? And then somebody else asked um, about any special caution taken with uh, patients with bipolar disorder when you're doing um, the time in bed restriction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, bipolar disorder patients, uh, we are very careful in doing CBTI with them. Uh, often we don't do sleep restriction at all. And we just do stimulus control. Or if we do any sleep re restriction like component, we do sleep compression, meaning that it's milder version of sleep restriction, not doing the way we do with other patients, but just um, reducing their time in bed slightly and reg uh, keeping regular schedule. So that's important question and seizures, epilepsy, we don't do sleep restriction in some cases. Now, uh, another question was about person, people who get wake up and stay in bed and and then become more aroused. I don't know if the, uh, they mean in the middle of night or in, in the morning, but that happens a lot, by the way, because they build up anxiety uh, as they uh, awake. That's why we recommend getting out of bed, avoiding staying awake in bed. That will create a lot of anxiety. That experience will actually worsen the conditioning is very much yeah so and that happens actually to insomnia patient with anxiety issues and insomnia patient with much more uh, accentuated hyper arousal so okay yes Thank you. um someone uh, had a question about the um data on sleep duration if there's any data on sleep duration and cognition that um, oh, yes. anecdotally uh, yeah. in their practice, they've found that people who are sleeping less seem to complain more about memory and concentration difficulties. Okay. Really good question. Just, I think a couple of months ago, a paper on night nature aging using the UK biobank data, it showed that seven hours was the best sleep duration for cognition and depression and anxiety. So the predictor, there's clear data showing that. Have a look at that paper. Okay, great. Well, there are a lot of questions, Dr. Cho, um, a lot of interest in this uh, really wonderful presentation, and we're yet out of time. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz, and thank you all.